Welcome to the Brain People Podcast, a show where four mental health experts team up to bring you practical tools for overcoming mental health challenges. The Brain People don't replace your doctor or therapist, but we will give you some extra tools to help you on your journey. So join us as we fight mental illness, one episode at a time. Welcome to the Brain People Podcast. My name is Dr. Katie Elson. I'm a licensed clinical psychologist and joining me is... My name is Jonathan Edens. I'm a psychiatric psychiatric PA. All right. And today we're going to be talking about communication and conflict resolution techniques for a better relationship. Now, Jonathan actually chose this topic I and did. I think it's always great to start with the why, right? Mm. Of not just why did you choose it, but why is it important for us to talk about? Uh, a great question. Um, the reason I would say I chose this topic is because it's a topic in which I feel that I have some level of uh, non, not formal education on, um, mm -hmm. but something that I've been personally sort of passionate about. Um, reason being, uh, I, I'd see other, other than our relationship with God, the relationship with your spouse as being the most important relationship, mm -hmm. uh, that you will ever have. And so I found it kind of silly that I spend so many years in the educational model, learning about how to be a you know, PA, but mm -hmm. spend almost no time learning how to actually have a quality relationship. So my wife and I were both committed to learning what, mm -hmm. uh, how to, how to actually have a good relationship. And I think. Um, the result of that um, has definitely been productive, mm. um, but uh, the process of that looked like reading a lot of books, you know, mm -hmm. listening to some podcasts, um, reading blog articles on specific topics and stuff, and then just so this this process of ongoing education. Mm. And uh, you know, when I got into the mental health field, you know, kind of focusing more on. Uh, Focusing more on books that were uh, relationship focused, but also psychology focused. So mm -hmm. using some of the principles uh, that we use all the time, you know, like cognitive behavioral therapy uh, in and into weaving that into um, just uh, a, a relationship in general, but the marriage relationship specifically. So one of the books that we'll be referencing a lot today um, is called Feeling Good Together. And I think mm -hmm. uh, in this book, David Burns does, does an excellent job of being relatively concise, very practical. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, the techniques that he espouses are in, in my uh, personal experience has been quite effective. Mm -hmm. Now here I was thinking you chose it because you knew I just got married oh. and you're like, <laughs> I need to tell her, I need to equip her. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> um, but I, I love the point that you made of, and that I think applies to everyone mm -hmm. of we put so much time and energy into other things in life, right? Other than relationships. And if we really recognize how important relationships are, then why aren't we spending more time and energy into trying to improve it, sure. including at the core of it, communication and conflict resolution? Absolutely. And um, it's, it's, uh, it is funny that you bring up the fact that you were newly married. And so, you know, some, some of the listeners might be thinking, are we really qualified to be talking <laughs> on this subject? Cause uh, you just got married a month or two ago, right? Mm -hmm. um, I'm coming up on six years of marriage. Mm -hmm. um, and I've been dating, i had been dating my wife for about four years prior to that. Right. So we've been in a relationship for, for 10 years, but there's definitely, you know, other you know, people, well, Dr. Bynes specifically, uh, that does have some more experience, um, you know, in marriage. Um, but that's, you know, uh, not to say that, um, you know, we, we can't speak on the subject and that mm -hmm. you guys uh, can't gather some useful information. Um, mm -hmm. We're here just to, I think, to learn just as much as, as you guys are. And so we're often sort of appealing to, uh, you know, other individuals that do have far more experience than what we do. I mean, but if you think about it, right, we're talking about relationships. These are not just specific to marriage. Sure. And so um, some of the best practice that I've had is actually with friendships, mm. right, with coworkers, with clients, with a dynamic kind of diverse um, scope of relationships. And I think it's important for our listeners to think these are things that are important for any and all relationships from the lowest intimacy to the most, like the deepest intimacy, right? Because sure. they definitely, it's at the core, if we're social beings, it's at the core of who we are and it's necessary. And we don't really 
we don't get educated on how to have healthy relationships. Yeah, so absolutely. So I, I want to reaffirm what you were saying, but if you are not married, right, if you're not mm -hmm. in a relationship, uh, in an intimate relationship, um, don't turn off this podcast. There's yes. still a lot to learn. Yes. Now, so we talked about a little bit of your why, but also the importance of effective communication that like we're talking about it because it's important. So what's the importance of effective communication in a relationship? So uh, I think many people are going to uh, you, you sort of seem to get sort of like two camps when I ask people about uh, how important communication is in a relationship. And oftentimes people uh, you know, will say like, oh, it's the most important thing. Mm -hmm. Right. And then on the flip side, oftentimes people say, well, I'm communication. It's just about talking like talking's not hard. I've been doing it my entire life, mm -hmm. but there's clearly a skill uh, to it. And when that uh, when you know, and you don't need to be overly skilled at, you, know, you don't need to be an excellent orator, right? Mm -hmm. To be skilled at communicating with your spouse or with a friend or whatnot. But when you have maybe some basic kind of techniques or a basic perspective about how you sort of approach this, oftentimes it will lead um, to greater intimacy in mm -hmm. the relationship mm -hmm. um it will lead to you being able to and your your the the uh we'll just say the partner in this case um being able to better express their needs their desires um and express themselves openly um mm -hmm. and clearly so mm -hmm. um from that standpoint you know communication is very um is very useful um, however, it can also lead to a, a reduced chance of things like misunderstandings, mm -hmm. hurt feelings, resentment that builds up over time, mm -hmm. uh, simply because things are being communicated more effectively. Mm -hmm. And then, uh, and then lastly, good communication does help to build trust and intimacy, uh, making the relationship stronger over time. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And if you think about if relationships are part of our everyday life, we're talking about mental health here. Mm -hmm. If I can magnify the benefit of intimacy, trust, joy, so forth in my relationships and then minimize conflict, right? Of course, my mental health is going to be improved. Um, so both from a relationship standpoint, but also from a personal standpoint, like it will it will improve my own well-being. Absolutely. And in uh, in the marriage relationship specifically, because the book Feeling Good Together does primarily focus on the marriage relationship, um, he does talk about the ratio of like positive to neg negative interactions. And, you know, oftentimes the people that come and say like, oh, my marriage is not doing well. Mm -hmm. Like if you were to take a really analytical look at it and just sort of make it kind of black and white in the sense of, every interaction that you guys have, would, do you both step away from that interaction thinking, mm -hmm. oh, that was a good reaction, a neutral reaction, mm -hmm. or a bad reaction? And so if your general feeling is that the, the, the sort of the ratio of negative interactions that you mm -hmm. have is greater than that of the positive ones, then your, your marriage is mm -hmm. obviously, your impression is going to be that it's failing, right? Yeah. Um, and so, so uh, oddly enough, it wasn't 100% positive uh, react, um, I should say, interactions being the ideal. Mm. Uh, there does seem to be mm -hmm. a ratio that is somewhat ideal. And I think in the book, he quoted like four out of five or something mm. along those lines. Like, I, I wouldn't get too um, worried about the specific number. Yes. But the point of the matter is, is that um, we definitely want to be working towards having more positive interactions. Mm -hmm. And we definitely want to make the negative interactions more mm -hmm. productive and um, mm -hmm. less uh, problematic, we'll yeah. say. And I love that last point because it's not an absence mm -hmm. of conflict. I always tell the couples I counsel, it's not the absence of conflict, it's how quickly you remedy it, right? And I love the word productive because if you learn how to be more productive, including using co communication and conflict resolution skills, then you have those healthier, stronger relationships because you're learning and growing from those conflicts. Sure. So let's uh, let's talk about the three qualities. Mm -hmm. So um, effective communication in general requ requires uh, three uh, three general qu qualities, um, and uh, there's an acronym for this uh, that I think is off that is very <laughs> useful. Uh, the EAR acronym. So that's E A R. Um, why don't you walk us through the first one? Yes, empathy, and I. I love this topic. I, I think we could even do a whole episode on empathy um, because it's so, so needed. And I think sometimes people misunderstand it. Um, you, it is a big component of it is acknowledging the other's feelings. Um, sometimes people, I think, overemphasize the emotional component of, oh, I just have mm. to feel it. Um, but empathy actually has three main components, cognitive, emotional, and compassion. 
which I love because sometimes you may not feel it, but cognitively, right, you're trying to understand. And then often the feelings can come together as a result of that. And then the compassion is as I understand and as I feel, I'm led towards an action in my empathy. Um, and then find a focus on a piece of content you are you can agree with. So it doesn't mean empathy doesn't mean you totally agree, um, but you can still be able to extract what, you know, try, try to put yourself in their shoes, as they say, sure. to understand, even if you don't fully agree. So the the next part of the acronym, if uh, if you know how to spell, right, E A R, right. So the the next one is A, which stands for assertiveness. Uh, this one can be a little bit, um, yeah, it has to sort of fit within the acronym. So sometimes it can be a little bit confusing. But this is essentially um, assertiveness in effective self expression, right? So being able to express your feelings in a direct, open, and a tactful manner. So this would include using things like I feel statements, such as I'm feeling unheard or invisible. Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. So this is uh, being able to be, um, you know, sort of confident and well-rounded in the way in which you uh, express your thoughts. Um, and so it's not necessarily being assertive in the sense of like demanding mm -hmm. right, or confrontational. That's yeah. not what we're talking about here. Mm -hmm. And I think it's really important to realize you what's underneath this is you need to know yourself in order to be assertive. So a lot of people just focus on the skill of assertive communication, but you really need to understand what are my needs, right? What are the things I want to express before just asking or expressing something? And then uh, would you like to elaborate on the R? Yeah, so respect. I think this is something that people recognize, yeah, definitely important uh, for relationships and for communication. Think about for a moment how it feels when someone doesn't respect you. Sure. Right. So, of course, we need to um, have that and and offer that to um, the person, the partner or friendship. Um, so express your thoughts in a caring way and controlled way, um, which is the way that you express them, but also in how you're hearing them. So respect can even be through silence. Mm. Right. Yeah. Uh, one thing I would add to that is uh, the. One of the basic tenets of effective communication is not so much how you express yourself, but it's mm -hmm. how it's interpreted, mm -hmm. right? And so um, what you deem as being respectful may not be what your partner uh, deems as being respectful, mm. right? And so uh, obviously this is part of, uh, you know, the marriage relationship or any friendship or long-term uh, business partnership, all of these things, you will learn the other person over time, right? Mm -hmm. And so initially you may not fully recognize what it is, what are the qualities, what are the the tone of voice, the body language, the behaviors mm -hmm. that you need to do in order to demonstrate to them that you are being respectful. Because oftentimes, like mm -hmm. I said, um, you might you might, you were raised a particular way, mm -hmm. right? And and so you just naturally are th uh, inclined mm -hmm. to think that other people deem that type of behavior or that type of language as, as something that's respectful, but mm -hmm. that's not always the case. And so yeah. you have to be open-minded about maybe changing your ideas and mm -hmm. modifying it depending on the context of the situation. Yeah, which I always emphasize for couples, you have to be teachable, right? You have to be humble, to recognize just because I'm comfortable or I have an upbringing or so forth. Um, respect also includes your thinking, which is connected to the empathy part too, is how, how does this person receive it? And I need to be humble enough to be taught. Right? Sure. Um, so definitely we see that these are core components um, that are needed for communication. Um, so let's talk a little bit about some common communication errors. Yeah, there's uh, there's quite a few of them, and we'll <laughs> just um, we'll maybe just list uh, some of them, and then maybe highlight a couple of them. But uh, blame and self blame, so mm -hmm. other blame, self blame. These mm -hmm. are incredibly toxic, and arguably one of, if not the uh, most toxic thing in a mm -hmm. relationship. Many many relationship gurus, so to speak, have said that uh, a relationship that is founded on uh, blame, or I should say, uh, maybe not founded on blame, where there's a lot of blame coexisting mm -hmm. in the relationship and both partners see the other as the primary problem, mm -hmm. that relationship is doomed to fail. Yeah. Right. Uh, yeah. And so, so that's definitely a big one. Uh, defensiveness is, is also a big one. Uh, belittling, 
uh, labeling. So that would be, you know, making like assigning labels typically mm -hmm. in a derogatory way uh, to the other person. Sarcasm, right? Mm -hmm. And just sort of a joking, unserious and attitude. Oftentimes I'd say men are more, more prone to this particular mm -hmm. one. Um, and we often see uh, some of the concerns or complaints that maybe our partner has is not being a big deal, right? And so mm -hmm. we can sort of sarcastically um, use use language that uh, makes it seem as if we're not that we're not taking mm -hmm. um, the other seriously. So diversion would be just basically redirecting the conversation, right? Mm -hmm. Because you don't want to deal with it. You just want to mm -hmm. avoid it. Uh, stonewalling. Um, so stonewalling is kind of another sort of form of diversion in a sense, mm -hmm. but you know, it's essentially, it's, an, it's essentially a pattern of avoidance where mm -hmm. you just kind of shut down. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, and uh, you put that wall up, yep. right. Which definitely of course would be a huge barrier to further communication. Mm-hmm. Uh, fixing it. This is a, another big one that I think men classically uh, are are a little bit uh, more inclined to do. So you know, always looking for the problem that we want to fix versus sometimes just sitting there listening, not necessarily mm -hmm. always needing to have some sort of input. Mm -hmm. um, and have then, you seen the video? It's not about the nail. No, I haven't. You uh, have to see it after this, but okay. it, it perfectly describes this. Yeah, Fair it's enough. great. <laughs> Watch it. Well, listeners. Uh, maybe put it in the show notes or something. <laughs> and then uh, passive aggressiveness is another one that we definitely uh, want to be avoiding when we are, um, you know, trying to communicate effectively. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And just take a pause for a moment and just reflect on which of these do I do? Right. Because sure. it's easy to be like, OK, yeah, I can see those as errors and it stays here versus being reflective of which ones am I most guilty of, right? Not which ones are my partner or my friend or coworker, because sure. that also is where our mind goes to, but which ones do I do? And then really honing in on that and be like, I want to be committed to working, you know, to not doing stonewalling. Instead of me withdrawing, shutting down, I want to approach. And just doing the opposite of these can often be something like an easy task to start trying to work towards better communication. Yeah, and I'll, and I'll say, you know, personally, like I definitely struggle with um, defensiveness and mm -hmm. the problem solving. Like it's often, it's just, I think part, partly, and this is, um, you know, I'm not trying to justify it or whatnot, but the way that my brain works mm -hmm. makes me very effective at some things. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I, and, you know, to a certain extent, like what I do here with beautiful minds. Um, but then in a relationship, I still mm -hmm. take a lot of that demeanor when I yeah. go home and I'm in problem solving mode. It's like, oh, mm -hmm. we've got 30 minutes. I got to figure out a solution here. <laughs> right. Um, and that's that's obviously not always a good strategy. Mm -hmm. So um, did you want to comment yeah. on yours? I mean, I think defensiveness is something ingrained in all of us right um so i definitely can can resonate with that one of wanting to so maybe for me the way that it comes across is explaining mm. right of like i'll explain why i did something right versus just acknowledging like oh this is how it made you feel regardless of the reason why i did it i'm listening to you so the defensiveness results in me wanting to explain, um, which is kind of also related to like the therapy part of like, sure. well, if you understand why I did it, <laughs> but and then that's also somewhat related to diversion um, versus holding on to the problem and it takes a lot of humility to say, yeah, you're right. Like this, what I did was hurtful to you. Yeah. And oftentimes, I mean, defensiveness is simply just interpreted as um, you're not listening right or uh you don't believe me you're telling me i'm wrong mm. right that's yeah. that's a lot of that's you know oftentimes that's that's what when you start going on and explaining something right that's often what's mm -hmm. going to be going on in their mind yeah. so let's uh let's move on and, and talk about um some specific techniques that we can use to communicate pr uh uh, productively and to prevent or mitigate conflict. So we we kind of break this down into two sort of different sets of skills. Uh, the first one would be listening skills and the second one being self-expression skills. And so I'll, I'll go ahead and take the first one. Mm -hmm. And this is arguably one of the most uh, powerful techniques that you can mm -hmm. use uh, when you are in the midst of an argument. Mm -hmm. And that's essentially uh, just finding an element of truth in what the other person is saying. Um, this is uh, referred to in the book, Feeling Good Together as the disarming technique. Mm -hmm. And so 
to just explain a little bit about why this is so powerful, but it's there's essentially a paradox um, in communication in relationship building that we sometimes see. So, um, and I'll go so I'll go ahead and explain what I'm talking about here. But we sometimes refer to this as the law of opposites. When you try to defend yourself from a criticism that seems totally irrational and unfair, you'll instantly prove that the criticism is completely valid. In contrast, if you genuinely agree with the criticism that seems totally untrue or unfair you'll instantly prove that the criticism is wrong and the other person will suddenly suddenly see you in an entirely different light. So to give a very obvious example here, if somebody calls you extremely arrogant, mm. right? Very prideful, a narcissist, and you say, "You know what? You're right. I am those things and I see that, right? And I'm and I and I would love to be able to work on this." Mm. That is essentially showing that there's a level of humility there. And this mm -hmm. goes to show with a lot of complaints that we might have of mm -hmm. the other, that if you actually embrace the uh, some truth in what the other person is saying, all of a sudden they're like, they're taken aback perhaps. Mm -hmm. And they, and, um, you're, you're actually going to be working on the perspective that they have of you, mm -hmm. the interpretation that they have of you. And, um, sometimes almost immediately, it, you know, everything that they were believing in that moment can be thrown out the window. Yeah. Um, and DBT, we often say validate the valid, right? The one thing that I would say for people who have, um, the tendency to validate the invalid of, let's say mm -hmm. somebody's gaslighting you and like they're telling you you're, that sure. you're wrong, you're arrogant, is some people have the opposite concern of like, you're right, you're right. And they're taking on something that is not correct. So you want to be careful in not just agreeing with someone for the sake of agreeing, but you do, the person grows respect for you if you're willing to be humble and accept and validate the valid, for sure. Yeah. And and the 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 aspect of this, or I should say one component of this that's incredibly important is when you're using the disar disarming technique, as I said, you find an element of truth. Mm -hmm. So you yeah. you find something that you can latch on that yep. you guys can both agree on. And so even if it seems like a, a really small part of the conversation, just just uh, in the conversation, demonstrating that you are trying to understand and empathize with the other person mm -hmm. that usually will bring down a lot of those walls, mm -hmm. you know, the, the, especially the defensiveness that often comes up. Mm -hmm. So this isn't about agreeing with everything they're saying, mm -hmm. but this is about agreeing on something, right. Mm -hmm. And starting the conversation there, because then it shifts you from a, uh, you know, um, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Like basically somebody that's attacking them yeah. to somebody that's uh, now on their side. Yes. And I was actually thinking about that when you're describing that, especially in a marriage, the more and more that you can come together of like, hey, if you're right, right, let's come together and like work on this. Right. Um, so definitely going from like the opposing side to a, a team member. Right. Yeah. Uh, so some of the things that do get in the way of the being able to do the disarming technique, mm -hmm. things like pride, fear, and truth. Mm -hmm. um, these things, uh, I think pride um, is is fairly obvious, right? Our ego gets in the mm -hmm. way of us being willing to admit that there's anything wrong with us, mm -hmm. right? Fear, uh, the fear of being sort of found out or admitting that there's a, there's a, a big problem, right? And then the truth, uh, obviously in many cases, especially in a marriage, um, truth is subjective, mm -hmm. right? It's usually argument, most of the arguments, and I'm not saying all truth is subjective, but please don't misinterpret <laughs> me. But what I'm saying is like your truth um, in the moment, so your much perspective. Of, your perspective, mm -hmm. right? is often a sim simply a matter of opinion. Um, mm -hmm. I don't know if there's actually been real research on this, but in some of the marriage conferences I've gone to, they said something like 70% of arguments did not have a resolution, mm -hmm. right? It was a matter of difference of opinion between the two parties, mm -hmm. right? And so realizing that most of the time, uh, like you can uh, skin a cat multiple ways, so to speak, right? Uh, if you are willing to relinquish some of your own desires or feelings of control mm -hmm. and and recognize that there's probably an element of truth to what the other person is saying mm -hmm. then you can you can um sort of exchange in your mind uh the conviction that you have about what you think is your mm -hmm. truth and actually uh make it uh more of a subjective uh, sort of thing mm -hmm. So uh, let's move on to empathy, the second yeah. part. Yeah. Um, and so this is broken down to both thought and feeling empathy. Would you like to explain those for us? Yeah. So I, lo I love that it's separate and I already touched on it a little bit before. Um, I didn't realize I was jumping ahead. Um, <laughs> but thought empathy, you're 
a bit a, a good practice is paraphrasing what another says, right? So it's like, Jonathan, what I hear you saying is, um, and I think sometimes people make this very mechanical, right? Of like, oh, I need to say the right things and use the right words. But what it's communicating is I am listening. Mm -hmm. Therefore, I'm reflecting back to you what I'm hearing, right? Um, and if you're unsure, you can always like check in with them. Is, is that what you meant? Um, and so, and, and I love this phrase too, let me see if I understand you, right? Um, and sometimes we're we're right or sometimes we're wrong, but again, it's communicating, I am trying to listen and understand. And this isn't being a parent. Right? Exactly. That, that is a very key component here. This is not being, <laughs> <I'm sorry. laughs> I'm listening to you, Jonathan. <laughs> Thank you, and I appreciate the joke. Uh, so you, you definitely don't want to repeat word for word uh, what the other person has said to you, because um, that is going to have the opposite effect of mm -hmm. you're, you're not actually listening. You're not trying to understand. Mm -hmm. You're just trying to, you know, maybe fulfill a particular technique yeah. or whatnot, rather than actually um, trying to engage in the conversation. Yeah. And you see that sometimes people do this. They're like, oh, okay. I, you know, the therapist told me that I have to, you know, have these empathic skills. And so look, see, honey, I am repeat, like, I'm listening and you can tell that they're tuning out, but then they're just catching enough mm. to reflect it back. And that's not what we're talking about here. And that's why it's really important. The next component of feeling empathy, right? Because sometimes you can hear what they're saying, but you're not listening. I like to say you're listening with your heart, right? Feeling empathy is acknowledging how the person is likely to feel in that moment. So they may communicate something, but you're like, hey, I noticed it, it, it seems like, like you're communicating this through a feeling empathy, right? Um, and especially in that context, because for a different person, they may be communicating the same exact thing but in that context for that person, they may be expressing something differently. Um, so here's an example. I imagine you might be feeling now it's important not to tell someone how they're feeling. Right. Right. You're reflecting back like this is what I'm gathering like and checking in with them. I, you might be feeling angry like Jonathan, when you're telling me about your experience of working with your coworker, Katie, you seem very disappointed. <laughs> no. <laughs> right. So it's reflecting the feeling um, and that really bonds people. And this is not just in the context of marriage, but it's like, wow, you're listening, you're listening with your heart and you're empathizing in that moment and sharing that feeling. They say empathy is like coming together and wanting to share that feeling together. And that's extremely bonding and building of intimacy. Yeah, and simply uh, one of the caveats to this particular strategy is not that you just uh, put the words I feel in front of mm -hmm. every sentence, it's saying, I feel like you're being a jerk. Right. Or I feel, uh, uh, yeah, I feel you're a jerk or I feel uh, you're a narcissist, you know, those types of things. That's not productive. <laughs> yes. Right. But you're you're uh, through the means of self-expression. You're trying to dig in deep and realize, OK, what are the emotions um, that I'm feeling right now? Because mm -hmm. I want to convey that just like I'd like to also receive mm -hmm. that as well. And so so you can also say things, you know, in addition to say anger, but some of the other core emotions, things like guilt and sadness, right, mm -hmm. feeling stressed, feeling tired feeling fatigued right these are mm -hmm. these are important things uh, that are oftentimes um useful in a conversation to mm -hmm. convey as well all right now the next one so the next one is inquiry uh so this is essentially asking non-confrontational and genuine questions to learn how the other person is feeling or 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 you know simply using it kind of for the purpose of brainstorming and problem solving solving now some of you uh active listeners right, might might have heard problem solving and think well aren't you contradicting yourself and uh the point mm -hmm. with inquiry is not to jump in and start problem solving right away right that's that comes later right mm -hmm. that's when you know a lot of the sort of emotional chargedness chargedness of the relationship has maybe dialed down and you guys are both clearly in that state of, okay, well, what are we going to do next? Mm -hmm. Right. And so you can start asking questions about how do we handle this? Mm -hmm. But, um, but inquiry is, uh, one of the easier, uh, techniques I would say to, to, uh, get more skilled at, uh, mm -hmm. of the five techniques we'll talk about. But still there are some nuances there that you do want to be careful with. And so much of the time, uh, you know, people still, even though it is a relatively easy technique, uh, still struggle with it. Because when we're we're often used to trying to get the word in, we're mm -hmm. we're used to wanting to express our own opinion, mm -hmm. right? 
And, and sometimes we're trying to get in and out, so to speak, mm-hmm. like we're trying to get, get this over. And if we feel like we ask questions, it's just going to drag it on mm-hmm. for long periods of time. It's true. All right. Mm-hmm. So any thoughts about inquiry specifically? Yeah. So the, one of the thoughts that I had when you're describing this is you have to be genuinely, genuinely, that's a hard <laughs> word for me right now. Uh, you have to be genuine in your desire to know, mm. right? Because if not, then focusing it so much as a skill can lead to the over asking, right? Or asking at times where it's inappropriate, where the person is not even finished with their sentence or or some other time. So you have to be really caring and wanting to know more, right? It's like, you know, they talk about how stressful their their day was. And then asking a question would not just be like, okay, I need to ask the right question, but like, Oh, you mentioned, you know, this part of the day. Well, how did the other part of your day go? Right. Um, so you have to care in order to implement this skill. Absolutely. Um, so I realized going on to uh, the fourth skill is that we sort of double dipped a little bit. Mm-hmm. And I think we kind of um, uh, mixed in both feeling empathy and the I feel statements. Mm-hmm. But the fourth technique is the I feel statements, which I was touching on earlier. So just to just to clarify uh, the difference between the two. So feeling empathy is actually more so like I understand you must be feeling mm-hmm. uh, this particular way. Right? Yeah, so it's that's focused on the other yep, person. That's focused on the other person. I feel statements is when you have the time, the self expression, um, the option to to self express. Mm-hmm. Um, so so we won't uh, say much more because we've already gone over that um, other than the fact that when you use the words I feel prior Mm -hmm. to a statement, um, it comes across uh, a little bit more as a subjective sort of statement. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, it softens the blow, so mm-hmm. to speak, and uh, o- you know, often is going to open up the other person to becoming uh, less defensive, less maybe aggravated by the statement. Um, and that's not to say that you do so with the intent of aggravating the person, right? Mm-hmm. But it just kind of dials down uh, a lot of the tone and a lot of the mm-hmm. intensity. Yeah, and this one you'll hear in a lot of different um, relationship seminars and talks because it, it is really key. The I instead of you, right? Because oftentimes we do the you do this, right? Mm-hmm. You, and that's the blaming. And so already the I is they can't argue with your experience. And then the feel, which you highlighted, is really the subjective nature of we often pose things that we feel as facts. And so the other person responds with arguing against facts. Yeah. So I feel just helps you own it, right? And then the other person, if they respond with I feel, and so you say, okay, this is my part, that's your part, and then how do we come together? And then uh, the last technique, so the last technique is stroking. Um, So stroking, uh, to define it, would be finding or expressing something you genuinely find positive about the other person, even while in the middle of mm-hmm. a conflict. Uh, this can be like a compliment or it can be reframing the other the other's motives in a more positive way. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think that's really great. Um, kind of reminds me also of in an argument or something, you can you know hold your your partner's hand, right? Having some sort of physical touch, literal stroking <laughs> sure. for some, but it's just this idea that it really just brings down some of that intensity, um, whether through physical or in this case, when it's talking about even verbally um, saying something nice or um, something that can be positive that can help the person realize, hey, I'm not just fighting you here. Sure. I also see the good. Uh, this uh, needs to be genuine. It needs to be sincere. Mm-hmm. Right. One of the, I think, useful kind of strategies to to make this a little bit more natural is, you know, off. Yeah, especially in the marriage relationship, you probably married that person because there are certain elements, uh, certain <laughs> aspects of them you liked. And so it might be a worthwhile exercise to even think about all those positive qualities that that person has, you know, during a time when you're not sort of in heightened emotional state. Yeah, that's right? a great idea. And then when you are in that state, you can reference back that list that you've already created mm-hmm. and you can just throw a couple in there that do seem sort of natural to to the conversation. Yeah, right? the power of gratitude and that really builds admiration, which is a key thing for healthy relationships. 
So um, we wanted to do a quick sort of audience involvement exercise. Yes. Uh, and so we will just, I'll just give you the, the, the five techniques real quick. There's the disarming technique, which is once again, finding an element of truth in what the person is saying. There's empathy, um, two types, thought empathy and feeling empathy. So that's where you're sort of paraphrasing or acknowledging what you think the other person might be saying or feeling. There's inquiry where you are asking um, non-confrontational questions because you generally want to find out uh, what it is they think about a particular topic. You're using I feel statements to express yourself and you're using stroking, um, which is a form of some uh, a compliment essentially uh, for the other person. So what we're going to do is we are going to go through a few lines and mm -hmm. um, you know, after each line, we want you to think about maybe pausing uh, the podcast and then seeing if you can come up with what type of technique we're actually using mm. in this. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to read through the whole thing and then we'll go sort of line by line and we can, we can, uh, we'll maybe have you, uh, give us, give us what each line is. Okay. All right. So, um, so this is just, uh, a, an example of maybe a conversation and this is considered good communication, mm -hmm. not bad communication. So, um, just imagine, you know, maybe, uh, I'm talking to my partner or something along those lines in this case. So I might say, if I'm understanding you, then what you seem to be saying is blank. If that's an accurate interpretation, then you are clearly correct about what you just said. I imagine my previous response may have made you unhappy and annoyed with me. You are often very good at affirming and respecting me. However, I feel hurt and rejected by a comment you made to me yesterday. Would you be willing to share with me some more of your thoughts and feelings on the matter, including how we might resolve this issue? So the first line, uh, if I'm understanding you correctly, then what you seem to be saying is blank. What, what would that be? So that is thinking empathy, right? If I'm understanding you, right? A thought approach to empathy of what you're saying, focus on the other person. If that's an accurate interpretation, then you are clearly correct about what you said about. Wow, I already feel so good. You're clearly <laughs> correct. Thank you. And that's disarming. <laughs> yep. That would be the disarming technique. So the next line, if I imagine my previous response, oh, excuse me, I imagine my previous response may have made you unhappy and annoyed with me. So that's feeling empathy, unhappy and annoyed. Uh, you are very good at, you are often very good at affirming and respecting me. Stroking, right? Recognizing my good qualities or your partners in this case. <laughs> <laughs> uh, however, I feel hurt and rejected by a comment you made to me yesterday. I feel statements. Perfect. And would you be willing to share with me some of your thoughts and feelings on the matter, including how we might resolve this issue? inquiry awesome well you got a perfect score wow thank you <laughs> i did not have this cheat sheet in front of me <laughs> absolutely but. not so another thing that uh, i wanted to talk about today and uh, definitely uh, feel free to jump in here is uh some there, there's some excellent sort of communication techniques um from a variety of different sources but as many of you know uh, this is a uh, religiously affiliated practice and so we do like to incorporate some spiritual concepts and matthew 7 3 through 5 mm -hmm. Uh, is an excellent passage that I think um, if you don't just uh, just read through it quickly, but you actually take some time to think about the metaphor, mm -hmm. uh, there's some timeless principles in there that are um, incredibly useful in this mm -hmm. type of environment. So I'll just, actually, would you go ahead and, and uh, read Matthew 7, 3 through 5 yes. for me? Why do you look at the speck of sawdust in your brother's eye and pay no attention to the plank in your own eye? How can you say to your brother, let me take the speck out of your eye when all the time there's a plank in your own eye? You hypocrite. First take the plank out of your own eye and then you will see clearly to remove the speck from your brother's eye. So as I was thinking about this, uh, you know, I, I, I derived three principles and you may be able to come up with some additional ones, but I derived three principles from this that I think is relevant to today's conversation. And so I, 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 I called them perspective, priority, and precision. Um, and so in this, in this metaphor of you and I both have something in our eye and I'm 
you know, paying attention to that thing and I'm trying to address it. So mm -hmm. in this metaphor, the the thing is a problem. Like mm -hmm. we'll just say generically, it's a problem maybe mm -hmm. in the relationship. And so this metaphor, um, when we look at it more deeply, we, it shows us that we need to gain a deeper perspective. Mm -hmm. And so you need to view your faults and contributions to the conflict as far greater problems than you view your spouse's faults and contributions. Mm -hmm. And how we're getting that from the metaphor is that while there's a speck in the other person's eye, there's actually a plank in my own. Mm. And so um, I think what the author is actually saying is that we actually both have specks, but mm. relative to relative mm. to you, the speck is in my eye, which makes it look far greater, mm. makes, makes it look far bigger, right? Mm. And so I need to take my problem as being far bigger of a deal than, mm. than what yours is, mm -hmm. right? Uh, the second thing is priority. You need to address your issue first before you try to address the problem you see in your spouse. So if you're actually imagining that picture of having a plank in your eye, it looks kind of ridiculous, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. Um, and how can you actually um, be confident in your own perception of mm -hmm. things if there's something massive uh, sticking out of your eye, right? It's going to be blurred. It's going to be... Um, uh, distorted in a way, mm -hmm. right? And so really you want to be as clear headed as you want your sight to be as clear as possible. So mm -hmm. if you can get rid of your own issues, right? Or I should say, try to resolve your own issues as much as you can before mm -hmm. you go and try to address the issues of somebody else, that's gonna, uh, you're gonna be able to do so with a lot greater clarity. Mm -hmm. And then the last point is precision. So when you finally do try to address the problem in your spouse or um, you know, in, in the conflict, in the relationship, you must do so with extreme carefulness, accuracy, and tactfulness. Mm -hmm. And so imagine uh, uh, somebody that you really care about uh, comes to you and they do have uh, something in their eye and they hand you a pair of tweezers and they say, I need you to get this out of my eye. Mm. How careful are you going to be? Are you mm -hmm. just going to go in guns blazing like with those tweezers trying to pull that thing out? No, right? I would hope not, <laughs> of course. And so, so when we are trying to address a problem in somebody else, we want to mm -hmm. come with that level of tactfulness mm -hmm. and accuracy and care, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. And so I think, you know, those things are some of the things that I took from this particular passage. Mm -hmm. And uh, to me, it's just, it's, it's uh, incredibly deep mm -hmm. um, and, and uh, is very relevant to today's conversation. Yeah. And using that um, description of you saying, you know, if someone hands you tweezers, right, they're not going to hand you those if you have a plank in your own eye. Sure. Right. So it is really important. And I often tell the couples I counsel, like you need to focus on yourself first, right? They don't have respect for you if you're pointing out all the problems that they have and there's a glaring problem that you have and you're not even addressing it. And so you're really um, hurting each other by just pointing the finger and never addressing because really what you can most address is your own problem first, right? Sure. And then you also, the fact that you said, hey, handing them the tweezers, you can't just go and take, because I think sometimes the the temptation is I, I can fix my my partner or my friend or whomever it may be, and you can't. Right. They have to be willing and they have to invite you into that. And together you can, but they have to hand you the tweezers. So first focusing on yourself and then uh, allowing a person to invite you into that because you can't just try to change somebody on your own. That's a great point. I really, I really yeah. like that point. I'll, I'll add it for the future. Yeah, no I problem. Yeah, I only I thought of it when you said like <laughs> handing them the tweezers. I'm like, yeah, that's so true. No, but inviting, inviting, allowing them to invite you in because to a certain extent, and this is something I always say, but I hadn't really connected the two, um, was that, you know, we, we, as you said, we need to be able to change ourselves first and we can sort of enact change passively mm -hmm. oftentimes influence. in our spouse, yeah. right? Through influence, because we are doing um, we're, we're doing, you know, uh, working on ourselves, right. To mm -hmm. improve ourselves, working on our problems. And, uh, you know, hopefully if, if the spouse is paying attention mm -hmm. or the friend is paying attention, they will see the change yeah. and that will be very appealing to them. Mm -hmm. And so I, I often call it the mirroring effect, mm -hmm. right. Yeah. Um, but, but there, but of course, like we do know in that type of relationship that yes, you can enact change, but as you said, the other person needs to be open to it, right? Mm -hmm. They need to invite you in to it. And they're not going to do so if they don't trust you. Yeah. Right. And so all of the other, all of the other things that we talked about today is about, as we said, initially, when we talked about effective communication is about breeding trust. It's about breeding mm -hmm. intimacy so that when there is a problem that needs to be addressed in your partner, 
uh, they will willingly let mm-hmm. you in. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Now, just some other kind of thoughts to, to wrap up um, in communication, the tone of voice and the body language is also really important. So Jonathan, what should, how should we speak with our tone? What, is there any particular guidance for people? Yeah, I would say, you know, being respectful, being calm, being non-confrontational, avoid using accusatory or aggressive tones. Mm-hmm. Um, you'll notice I didn't say anything about uh, loudness, mm-hmm. right? Um, I think there are places for sort of elevating mm-hmm. your voice. Um, you know, you don't want to do it in an uncontrolled way, right? Mm-hmm. And that's sort of the differentiation. Um, and so, you know, there are, um, things that oftentimes we do associate as being intrinsically negative, like, Mm -hmm. you know, yelling. And, you know, I would say that in the vast majority of the cases, that's not going to be appropriate. Right. Um, but in, in very specific cases, if you're practicing all the other things, right. And then at some point, the, maybe the, the situation seems to qualify for it. There've been rare exceptions in my own marriage where I'm not one that generally raises his voice, Mm -hmm. but where I have, and it's actually been, um, because my wife trusts me and she knows Mm -hmm. that I'm not aggressive with her. Mm -hmm. Uh, she knows that in the elevation, I am expressing the seriousness by which I see Mm -hmm. this particular issue. And that has sometimes helped kind of jog, uh, Mm -hmm. her realization of, Hey, um, this is something that we really mm. need to actually focus on yeah. coming together and addressing. And I'll just say a quick um, point on that too for tone. Um, be mindful, even though you might objectively say my tone is fine, mm. um, see how it impacts the other person. Now, that's partly, right? But then the other person needs to be responsible of also recognizing the intent behind the tone. And I say that because I have a lot of couples who they're, one of their uh, spouse, their spouse is hard of hearing, right? And they speak in a very loud and and sometimes um, aggressive like tone yeah. and they're triggered, right? And so one partner, the, per- the partner that has that hard of hearing, um, we work with him to be able to try to bring down his volume, but then also on her part to be able to understand and um, sympathize with his challenge and, and limitations. Um, and sometimes that could be also related to um, how you were raised. And so you might be triggered, not because of the person's tone, but because it reminds you of someone else. Mm. And so just knowing that working together and understanding and trying to come to a place of understanding with the tone of voice. And this can even be something if you're a little unsure whether your tone is good, you mm-hmm. know, using inquiry and, yes. and, and maybe even asking mm-hmm. um, how the other person is interpreting it. Cause yeah. you know, it, uh, like we said before, it does come down to ultimately how the other person interprets what you're saying or how you're expressing yourself, not simply just how you actually are. Exactly. And then uh, body language. So you want to touch a little bit on body language? Yeah. Body language. We communicate through our body, right? And so if you're having a conversation and you're trying to do empathy skills and other things, but your arms are crossed, right? You're communicating. Well, not all the time, but uh, some people are like, I'm just relaxed, but you can be communicating. I'm closed off, right? That could be part of stonewalling or defensiveness and other things. Um, rolling your eyes. I had um, a person in our DBT group who we were going through some communication skills and she's like, wow, I roll my eyes. I didn't realize and she just changed that and it dramatically mm-hmm. reduced their conflict because nice. he got triggered and then he would escalate and so forth. So little things that can really add up, uh, making aggressive gestures. Sometimes we do this to try to make a point, um, but overall it might make the point, but you lose trust and intimacy and safety in a, in a relationship. Um, eye contact is really important. Um, you have to be mindful with eye contact that different cultures um, interpret that differently. So in some cultures, sure. it's actually disrespectful if you look at them straight in the eye. So talking with your partner or friend or coworker of like, hey, you know, um, checking in with them. Is this is a good amount of eye contact or is this too much, too little? Um, using open body language, which also doesn't only this is not only for the person you're speaking with. It's also for you. So research shows that like if you put a pencil in your mouth to force a fake smile, you actually your mood goes up because Mm -hmm. how we um, use our body also then communicates to our brain. 
And so it can also change you and your disposition towards that person. And there's a, I think maybe one of the most watched Ted talks on YouTube where she talks about body language. Mm -hmm. And, um, uh, I think there's a lot of emphasis on like confidence and things mm -hmm. of that nature and the yeah. way that you, you know, position yourself. So, uh, yeah, oftentimes that, as you said, that simple change of just presenting yourself in a particular way, um, mm -hmm. is going to bring about, um, the right emotion. And you always say motion breeds emotion or something along those yeah, lines, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah. So even that sort of form of motion um, is also something that can affect your emotional state. Mm -hmm. And then always facing and directing your body towards the person. Uh, I remember a clear kind of interaction with somebody in grad school. And this is a guy that was, you know, potentially interested mm. and his body was turned away from me. And then, um, and, and it just felt so like, oh, you kind of in a hurry, felt like you're not fully present, sure. right? So turning towards the person is communicating, I'm here, I'm present, my attention is fully yours. So in conclusion, um, let's, uh, let's just briefly recap some of the importance of communication and conflict resolution um, using these techniques in a relationship. Why, why is this important, Katie? Mm -hmm. I mean, you can just, as you think about and reflect on all of these, you're building, as we mentioned in the beginning, that intimacy and trust, which I would say is like the fabric of relationships without communicating with empathy and listening and asking questions. Um, there is no relationship. And so if you really want to build that, um, these are essential. It's like building a home, right? You need these as foundational skills to build a solid home that when there is conflict, you're able to withstand the storms that that come because they will come for every relationship and different capacities. But um, yeah, I think a key component is the intimacy and trust. So we would uh, encourage you if you got any value from uh, the things that we've been saying, like it might not be a bad idea to save this podcast, right? Like, to mm -hmm. bookmark it because I know we went through a lot of information today mm -hmm. and it's unlikely that you're going to remember all of these techniques by simply listening through it one time. I know that's not been the case with me. I've had to sort of uh, reintroduce these concepts to me so that I can remember them. But these are techniques that are very applicable and you can go to your next conversation mm -hmm. um, with your partner um, or a friend or whoever and and start and and, and start practicing and mm -hmm. oftentimes it's not going to feel super genuine or sincere. <laughs> it's going to feel a little bit fake initially, mm -hmm. but there's a, there's an element of faking it till you make it here. Mm -hmm. Um, there's also sometimes, uh, if, if your if your marriage is really on the rocks, right. Mm -hmm. You may want to go the extra step and even say practice in front of a mirror mm -hmm. and see, like, see it is how, how, mm -hmm. how are you looking? What are you, what are you, what are you saying? Mm -hmm. Um, and, and so you know, th these, the practice makes perfect as they say. Right. Mm -hmm. And so re-engaging with these principles and, uh, you know, repetition, doing it over and over again, it will become more natural over time mm -hmm. and your marriage, you know, your other relationships in life are going to be significantly improved because of it. Mm -hmm. And just be compassionate to yourself and to you, your partner or to your friend who's trying this out. Just the fact that they're trying is communicating that they want a better relationship with you. Absolutely. All right. Well, thank you all for tuning in. And thank you, Jonathan, for choosing this great topic. I was excited initially. And as we were just talking and having this episode, um, I was extra excited. And I, I know a lot of people will be blessed. So thank you. And we'll see you next time on The Brain People. Thanks for listening. To hear more episodes, find us on social media, or support us financially, visit thebrainpeoplepodcast.com.